Nobody expects the Spanish. No, no, we're not doing that. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. And no one else will as we try to survive 100 days in Battle Brothers Legends as the true cleansers of corruption, focusing mainly on snuffing out evil wherever we find it, especially the ultimate form of unholy corruption, the undead. While attempting this, as you may have expected, legendary combat difficulty, legendary economic difficulty, and no starting funds. However, we'll be skipping the extra scaling settings again because I'm not completely insane yet. Our origin of choice this time will be the Inquisition, of course, a two-star or skull origin that supposedly isn't too easy or too hard, but in my honest opinion, this origin is harder than it looks because of your starting situation. The last time I played this origin on the channel, it was vastly different and has been nerfed since, but we'll get to that in a moment. The unique qualities of this start deny you the options of recruiting outlaws, and that kind of sucks because about half my parties are usually built on the back of outlaws, as those backgrounds are actually pretty good. Instead, the pious will flock to support us, whatever that means. To be honest, the only real saving grace of this origin, and the only reason you'd actually consider it, is because of the free mind over body perk that your brothers get. For those unacquainted, Legends has improved and expanded the ways your bros can deal with fatigue. Vanilla Battle Brothers only had Recover, a perk that lets you waste a turn to clean up most of the fatigue your bros accumulated, swing weapons, use shields or abilities a few times, then recover. Simple and effective, but repetitive. However, now in Legends we have multiple ways of working with fatigue. One of the ways is mind over body, as it allows you to convert excess resolve into percent reduction of fatigue. Every point of resolve over 60 will help reduce all fatigue costs, including magical skills and things like rally. And Mind Over Body builds are some of my favorite and most devastating creations to date, in my personal opinion, of course. Building around this free perk and aiming to have the most resolute team would be ideal, especially when dealing with the undead of all things. This will definitely help as we've chosen the undead crisis option, which might spice things up a bit, and also provide more pain as it's my most hated crisis. Other than all that, we finish up with the usual extra settings on a random seed, and we were ready for in the ensuing struggle that is this origin. Oh, and a last note before we start, I'm insanely grateful and want to say a big thank you to all the amazing support for the last video as it's blown up considerably. It was great to hear all of your wonderful supportive and kind comments of how you enjoyed watching the run, and I'm keen on hearing more and replying to them as well. As usual, you can watch the 11 and a half hour long VOD footage on my second channel if you want to see the fights and gameplay in more detail with extra commentary on top. Thank you to those who've already liked, commented, and subscribed as it greatly supports the channel and lets my video reach more people so they can enjoy this content as well. And if you if you haven't, please consider doing so because it's easy and free to support me as this took a lot of effort to make, thanks. Loading into the world, we're greeted by three starting party members this time, and they're actually pretty good stat-wise. No peaceables in sight. We have a witch hunter named- wait, ah crap, we can't keep him. Okay, I'll be honest and say I don't farm for seeds or try and rig the start of a playthrough, however today will be an exception because I like ranged bros and want them to be useful when fighting the undead. Curse you dynamic perks for being amazing but not giving me exactly what I want every time. Anyways, a lot of undead are resistant to piercing damage and most most ranged options suck against them. The only two that are quite effective are slings and throwing axes specifically, and I'm gonna get us a witch hunter that can chuck axes. Just give me a sec. Any second now. Sheesh, that was 10 restarts for a throwing expert. He better be worth it. Right, so this will be the new team, and this will be the seed of the world. Luckily, restarting a game to refresh your seed is rather easy, and it can help if you're given subpar bros. Welcome our new witch hunter, Theatred, with 56 range skill, night vision, and really good 64 resolve. We're gonna aim to utilize all of that for sure. Alongside him, we've got a fancy flagellant, Enrique, who has the Disciple of the Inquisition trait, a pretty nifty and unique trait with free stats, while ignoring negative morale checks from losing HP and current injury detriments. But since he is garbage melee defense, he'll eventually sit in our back lines, hopefully with a pole flail out of harm's way. Last but not least, we have our battle nun, Katarina. She's just a normal nun, but with great combat potential. And with these stats, I'm sure she'll become a decent frontliner if she survives. But that's practically it. This is the start, and it kind of sucks to be honest. The bros and stats are fine, but the equipment is what's going to fail us. Mediocre armor, a cat of nine tails, one of the literal worst weapons in the game, a crossbow and a flail, which are both unreliable early game weapons for level one characters, and only one shield. No starting funds is looking extremely rough, as I don't have many ways to fix the solution without money. And we're even starting at 27 coins per day as a daily wage. At least in the trader origin, we had 1400 bucks from our starting trading goods, so this is truly a step down. Oh, and I almost forgot to show the map we've gotten with this random seed. We spawn in the north, and after looking at it for a while, it's actually quite bad. No ports for quick travel, horrible distances between towns, and too many mutton baileys. Well, I guess it's just another icing on the challenge cake for this run. We start our first day at the castle of Force Fest, selling off our gear and extra food that I know are 100% expendable, and now we have $127 to our name. I'm predicting this is going to be a short run for sure. Stocking up on wooden spears of all things, a shield, and shuffling around our starting armor, we equip our thrower and our reach bro and place them on the front line. Sadly, their endgame builds will take time, as they need to contribute as meat 
shields and reliable damage throughout the early and mid game, because unfortunately you too may have recognized that our maximum party size is stuck at 3. Now don't fret, as usual this can be increased as we started the game at 0 and out and need to work our way to 500 to start increasing the size of our party. So basically it's these 3 are bust for a long time, ouch. They better start pulling their weight. Speaking of pulling their weight, we need some work out of these bros before they desert us as we only have one day of wages left. This is what desperation looks like. We set out to try and earn our first coin by quickly running to the nearby city Assested and seeing if they had any possible quests for three level one bros. Luckily they have a find a location quest and I'm glad I can make rent for the team for a little while longer as we hurriedly complete the quest. I immediately spend most of our newfound gains on malicious spear and a wooden shield that was on the sale in the marketplace and immediately replaced the flail in Katarina. The team now is all spears and shields, such a great pickup. Instead of taking the undead location on day one, a surefire suicide mission, we defend a very short caravan back to the castle we started the game at, obviously camping for some free medicine along the way. The sun was rising and just as we were getting a glimpse of the castle between the trees, yes, thralls. On literally day two, they ambushed our caravan. In normal gameplay, I'm against fighting thralls as early as they're well equipped and overwhelm your team with throwing weapons. However, I had a rush of bravery and this is more common occurrence when I'm on a caravan, as I have lovely compatriots that I can utilize, so to speak, whether they like it or not. So the fight began in the forest, no road to be seen, which is a funny but painful thing that happens quite often in caravan fights. It was the three of us and three caravan hands versus four thralls. Luckily, it wasn't more. Of course, I huddled together and tried to let my friendly meat shield's face tank. Basically, I just didn't want to get caught out and targeted by these dangerous foes. The start of round two gave me a surprise fourth caravan hand that popped out from the bushes and charged the thralls in front of us. This was good as we only had two to deal with and were working them down quickly. Round three, our turn, and Enrique skewered the spear-wielding thrall only to have the other thrall demolished by Theatred and finished off by Katarina. The one in one in the south ended in a draw as the caravan hand sliced off the thrall's head but bled out from his wounds. We quickly ran north to try and steal the last kills for ourselves but the help was quicker. Two kills were still awesome and we survived an otherwise deadly encounter this early in the run. We were rewarded with both weapons from both of our kills since we were practically broke and using wooden spears. We immediately switched them out for the new militia spear and deer antler lever. Ambition time and we easily chose the grabbing allies as I knew saving up 2k for a banner was going to take way too long with this playthrough. Quest completed as we we reached the castle, 10 meds from our camping efforts, and with our reward money I quickly found some armor on sale to upgrade our bros and left 119 bucks in the coffers to help us keep surviving for a couple more days. But no rest for us sadly, we are desperate to keep making money somehow and with the map being suboptimal, I had only one place in mind that could take care of us reliably this early in the game. There was a cluster of villages owned by the yellow faction just south to us and that's where I felt we could possibly survive. Day 3 and we visited Eisenheim but they offered us the wrong quests. Early game brigand locations are full of thugs and that's pretty difficult for early game parties. The delivery wasn't worth it either so we dipped and went west to the nearby big city of Ivanstadt. Another find a location quest and we were funded for a few more days as this cash buffer of 365 was nice to have. A cargo to the east or a caravan north to barbarian lands and I chose the short and sweet cargo delivery. We arrived the next day and because of the trickle XP we've gotten up until now our witch hunter and nun were now level 2. Enrique now had over 100 HP thanks to his 25% bonus of Colossus and Katarina got a permanent 20% bonus to XP from student. My favorite starting perk as it's the gamble to get level faster but sets you a perk behind until level 11. The village of Grubenheim offered us another undead location and we respectfully declined and took the caravan instead, this time heading west and utilizing the training camp for free XP along the way. Just as we left town, Theatred our witch hunter pulled me aside with a pained look on his face and rushed me to come see a disturbing sight. The disturbing sights turned out to be Enrique the Flagellant. No, he was not that ugly. He was just unconscious on the ground and bleeding from self-inflicted whip wounds. Hashtag just flagellant things. We cleaned him up and were just glad he didn't lose all of his blood. The caravan surprisingly went rather smooth from here as we traveled west past the big city. Just before we arrived, Grandpa fell down a well and we decided to help. Unfortunately, the lady didn't tell us how long Grandpa fell down the well for, and he was starting to smell. Well, that's our problem now. We, on the other hand, pulled into town and got 111 XP from the caravan and about 250 to 300 from the training. A nice boon for the small team. As expected, this gave level ups to all of our bros and Enrique got crippling strikes, higher injury chance, and 10% bonus damage to undead, as they don't take injuries. The Adder and Katarina both got even more stats from Gifted, an automatic pickup for me on almost every bro. Stats definitely keep bros accurate and alive. Arriving at turn one on the morning of day seven, we noticed one of my favorite town's events taking place, disbanded troops. Although rare, when this event happens, you can usually find more recruits, and sometimes really rare recruits as well. However, I immediately got depressed because there were no recruits available to at least gawk at with our full party of three. Now, a town having literally no recruits available without player intervention or really bad events is an almost impossible sight to see. But my current guess is that the most of the recruits who were spawning here were outlaw backgrounds,
hands, and thus were not fit for our righteous cause. We then mosey on down to the village of Gemenstein to continue questing, other than that questionable cult procession, and we found little to aid our cause. A caravan was heading further west, so we happily enjoyed more camping. A little ways down the road, interrupting our training session, were some knocks. Five to be precise, and I was rather confident in my ability to outsmart the hungry devils. And by now, you'll probably have guessed that outsmart means using caravan hands to do the dirty work. I won't over-dramatize it. We wiped the floor with their corpses. The map generously gave the caravan hands and us a lovely high ground to defend on, and we literally took no damage as we slaughtered them all, but only claiming two actually killing blows. Nothing fancy. 60 to 90 XP is nice and all, but not taking damage and not risking our bros' lives was the real reward here. Day 8 was going well. A great start to a sentence, I know. But we were literally moments from finishing a caravan when in the darkness, a band of 19, yes, 19 nomads attacked the caravan. May I remind you that there are three of us and it's only day eight. Thanks game, thanks legendary difficulty, thanks my risky decisions. Wait, why is this my fault? It's totally the game's fault and not a skill issue. Regardless, there were seven of us in total helping two donkeys and this would be practically a 3v1 fight. Indebted are weak, but you can't count them out. This isn't like a rabble fight and we were level three. I chose the painful and wise decision for our party and left those four caravan hands to their fate. I didn't like the west side of this map so far. Tail between our legs, and even more depressing, was the 115 renown we had grind so far, slashed to a mere 39. Ouch, we were almost back to square one. The only silver lining was Theater gaining a level up from the training we did during the caravan. We grabbed quick hands for him as he's going to be needing to swap his future throwing weapons quite often. We ran all the way back to Gemenstein, and they surprisingly offered us another caravan, to the east this time. Maybe we beat the messengers here, and they hadn't heard of the news of their last caravan. We totally said everything was going to be okay, and left to defend this new one, not knowing if it was going to be a repeat of last time. We trained once again, and what do you know, our training was interrupted again. But by three goblin ambushers this time. This was a rare and confusing sight. I was not really afraid, per se, I knew the damage was probably going to happen, but three ranged enemies without a single melee support were just going to be run down and killed in cold blood. So that's almost what happened. The passive caravan hands took a turn to wake up, but actually surrounded an ambusher that tried to flank south. Definitely weird to see them rush the enemy and be useful. We took the middle one and swiftly cut him down while only taking one arrow to Theatard's hand. The last goblin had some sense and ditched. Leaving the weird ambush behind us, we reached Ivan's stat safely and enjoyed the bountiful caravanning XP once again. 47 plus about 100 was nice enough to get Enrique and Katarina a level each. I chose Onslaught for Enrique because he had decent initiative and Undead are usually rather slow, and also because I didn't see any other options I liked. Katarina on the other hand went for balance to start a medium armor journey and hopefully getting some free defense to boot. Because of our sketchy armor situation, she was only able to get a bonus of 4 melee defense for now. When fully balanced, you can get up to 15 melee defense, which is a lot, and it's very nice for any bro. But my bros usually max out around 11 to 14 because armor and stat reasons. All in all, she had shoes to grow into. Even with a failed caravan, we were slowly accumulating cash and now sitting on 711 bucks. I was finding it easier to stay on top of wages than the cost of food. Luckily, the markets had a sale on some gear, and with the fall of the tracks quest available, it was a good time to upgrade our survivability. We camped to fix the goblin arrow pierced hand and set off in the night to track down the thieves. We found them in the morning and I decided to risk some cheese and camp out beside them as they weren't the running type. I was truly hoping that the pierced hand of Theater estimated to be healed in one to two days would be fixed within the next day. A gambling of spending time and also a gamble because if you leave the follow the tracks quest too long, then the thieves just escape and you fail the quest. However, my gamble paid off as many hours later we stopped camping for medicine and found that his hand was healed quicker than expected. Wonderful! We needed every advantage in our first unaided fight. Under the cover of darkness we struck. The map was a southern hill which provided almost no advantage to either side. It was 3v9 and we were outnumbered 3 to 1. But because of our previous efforts to gear up the party, I wasn't too worried. We advanced within range their pitchfork to goad the rabble into rushing us in melee. I did a risky coin flip for Theatred and jumped from the high ground to whiff an attack against the guitarist. However, two quick thrusts and Katarina claimed first blood to help balance my gamble, 3v8. I risked again with Enrique to try and clear the two scariest enemies on the field, the Hammer Bros, before they could cause damage. He took a hit that stripped all of his head armor and got dangerously low from another smack to the face. Glad he had all that HP, right? From here, the rabble swiftly fell and I still had one problem. Theatred was really struggling in a 1v3 and the rabble with the hoe was wailing on him non-stop. Luckily, we cleaned up the other combatants and were able to rush to his aid before he took serious damage. And thus, our first unaided fight was complete. A successful endeavor and even though rabble are scary nowadays because of their stronger perks, I felt as though we were on our way up. We returned to the city, bought some armor upgrades, and just when we were about to camp to heal up, we were informed that the town was no longer leaving us on red and actually replying to our DMs. This must be the way everyone starts making friends, right? Maybe one day that'll be me. <laughs> mm, right, back to the game. We camp till morning, only stopping to quickly catch and murder a thief trying to steal our supplies. Is nothing sacred in these lands, or will we have to clean out everything and everyone in our path? Apparently not. But we continued on the trail alongside the caravan as the morning sun rose. We had a perfect run, no threats, no issues, no worries, as we took the next two days quite casually along the roads to our way to Rorwall. 
Instead of training, we maxed out our capacity of meds by gathering 44 pieces along the way. We still got 123 XP from the caravan, which was nice, but now we had to find more work. I trekked through the forest road northeast to the swampy village of Swartbuck. I was sad to see they only wanted us to slay beasts and that it was not really a good risk right now. Leaving the town, I could immediately see why they were willing to pay for such work. Six knocks made me retrace my steps as I valued our bros' lives. We just passed the Mountain Bailey by morning and met some ill-intended travelers along the road. Nine rabble and I said, screw it, we'll take you all on, as this seemed like a better option compared to what was chasing us. Another 1v3 fight with two dogs and mostly mediocre weapons, I was feeling rather confident with our equipment and abilities. A dog fell early, but because of unlucky RNG, the first rabble didn't die until around three. However, after that first brigand fell, it was like dominoes in motion. The rest of the enemies crumpled into red heaps, and the ones that didn't now needed new pairs of pants. The fight was over quickly after that, and it was looking like we had a good grasp on these early game fights. A confidence booster for sure. Hmm, I wonder why these clouds are just rolling by- Oh, wait, the game crashed. As I'm quickly approaching 2,000 hours in this game, I've seen my fair share of crashes. The base game is usually okay, but mods do have their way of creating unforeseen problems that can be frustrating at times. Luckily, I learned from painful experiences that saving often and having multiple autosaves helps mitigate the damage. Luckily, the autosave wasn't corrupted and the second attempt at the fight was just as easy. The rabble loot was nothing to shake a stick at as usual, but we enjoyed the free XP. We returned to the roads back south and was just glad that we stayed on our toes as those knocks chased us yet again. Escape laborers met us along the road just like the trader playthrough, but we still didn't have any party space, so they didn't want to join us. We happily arrived back at Ivanstadt on the morning of day 17. I miss this little cluster of settlements and their continued support of available quests. This time they were offering some free cash in the form of find a location, and we made short work of that with the help of surrounding mountains. We cashed in the next day, but immediately put the crew to work, chasing more dishonorable and corrupt thieves. An evening stroll in the forest, and it was another 3v9. I had my eye on a spot of high ground for Enrique to utilize, but the enemy staff user got a lucky stun on him. This wouldn't have been a problem if he wasn't getting surrounded and whittled down, whilst our other two companions were a bit slow on the DPS in the south. Even worse was the fact that the rabble staff user was literally perma-stunning Enrique. It would be funny if it wasn't actually scary. I think he lost three consecutive rounds in total. After that reality check, it was around 7 before we could regroup and feel safe with some kills and fleeing enemies under our belt. We won, but it was quite a decent amount of damage taken for a simple fight once again. I was really starting to dislike certain types of rabble more than others, but with loot and XP and monetary rewards, I couldn't stay ungrateful for long. Theodred and Katarina both leveled up, and we grabbed Throwing Weapon Mastery for our Witch Hunter and Flail Mastery for our Battle Nun. After returning to the town at midnight, we took the quest rewards and were sitting on 1.4k cash. I was feeling rather stable at this point, and progress seemed to have been made despite the few issues we had. We spent a full day of camping to heal injuries, break down useless gear, and repair our own. This is an effort I thoroughly appreciate and do very routinely in most of my runs. In the base game, you either have to spend excessive money at a weapon or armorsmith to instantly fix your gear, or excessive money at a temple to treat your wounds, or just wait a very long time to hope it all gets sorted out before your next fight with tools and medicine. Camping is a godsend from Legends, to allow you to men to hone their attention into working on what really matters to you in the moment. Party upset from recent deaths or lack of food? Give your men a break and let them disconnect from the world as they rest their worries away. Overstocked by Rabble's wooden gear worth literally pennies to townsfolk? Break it down into components and use it to repair and maintain your bro's stronger gear to be able to keep fighting the good fight. Camping has many helpful ways to boost and support your party's efforts in this game and I can't live without it. But even after all those hours spent, the big city didn't refresh any quests so we headed south to Goldhof and arrived in the morning. The little mining village was doing well as we grabbed their two copper ingots for a cheap price. We also let them know that we'd happily deal with some more corrupt thieves and safely return their stolen ceremonial staff. Immediately upon embarkment of this task, Enrique had gained permanent fatigue from all this running around. Maybe extra exercise is truly good for you. Nah. We found the thieves really close by, and since they had an actual poacher, I tried camping till nightfall to not have anyone become a pincushion. The thieves eventually noticed us camping next to them and made a break for it, but coincidentally, a mercenary party known as Thunderwell were passing by at the perfect time for me to accidentally drag them into a fight. Whoops! I guess we're gonna be paid 420 bucks for literally no effort. How horrible! And we were literally sitting back as the brigands were swiftly cut down in four rounds as we took no damage and also got no kills. I didn't mind because we were getting paid, and we returned to the town to tell them that we totally did all the work retrieving their precious item. But once again, we had to move on to find more work. We headed eastward back to the villages that could give us quests. Wait, what? Ambush literally outside of town? As militia watched the stone throws away? I only saw beast tracks but didn't have a choice in the matter. We took up arms and hoped it wasn't the end. A forest ambush at night, no less. Now when getting ambushed, your party formation is completely scrambled and you have to really rely on RNG to get you through. Late game ambushes can be literal party wipes, even if from enemy groups that aren't as strong if you fought them normally. Fortunately, I don't hate forced ambushes and I think they're the best way to get ambushed. For as much as I hate rough terrain being hard to traverse, I really appreciate the trees. No, not like that. Impassable terrain can completely turn unwinnable fights into walks in the park, and with Forest having the densest impassable terrain, you can definitely make some insane bottlenecks. 
But I digress. This is an early game ambush. Six tier one knocks, not super threatening, especially since they're spread out and we have lovely higher ground to huddle together on. After some nice hits, we got decent momentum on the monstrosities. Leaving our lowest defense and rake on the corner wasn't amazing as he took a few hits, but in the end we cleaned up pretty nicely as he topped the damage meters despite the danger. We were happy to survive and continue towards more quests. We reached Eisenheim by midday and the small village had the gall to give our three bros the opportunity to attempt a four star quest, also known as a legendary quest. The star is technically skulls, but I explain everything in stars as a bad habit. The skulls on quests usually indicate how hard they are. One skull suggests that it's somewhat easier than your party strength. Two skulls suggest that it's roughly equal to your party strength. Three skulls suggest that it's somewhat stronger than your party strength. Four skulls means you die. You will most likely be facing enemies you are definitely not prepared for at your level and your strength. Specifically, this four skull follow the tracks will almost guaranteed have brilliant raiders amongst their ranks, even this early in the game. So in short, no, we will not be doing a four skull today. Oh, and from experience, I'd 100% recommend that you don't trust the skulls for figuring out how hard a quest is, or whether it's doable for your current party strength. Other than four skulls always being death, the other quests should be gauged on the type of quest, type of enemies involved, and the price they're paying, not the skulls. Anyways, back to it. A caravan two days north piqued our interest and instead was hopefully an opportunity to train the bros. We passed a group of rabble lying in wait and they didn't attack us. I guess our combined strength was getting pretty good as a deterrent. However, that didn't last long as eight knocks ambushed us just as dawn rose on the 22nd day. But just as the previous knock fight, they were all tier ones and we weren't in much danger unless they started eating. Having patience to let them surround us before dropping corpses on the battlefield was a good but risky tactic. With almost all of them engaged in melee, we turned on the heat and started dropping them like flies. However, our formation had a weak link and a caravan hand got slashed to pieces and two knocks were free to roam and eat. Good timing got us to them before they could get to the corpses and the fight was won shortly afterwards. Nice XP, but two fangs were enough to allow us to do some crafting. I'll get to that later as we have more important things to camp with this trip. Oh, and Enrique leveled up and we gave him flail mastery. Grabbing the mastery for weapons you don't own yet is not ideal and not the most efficient way of choosing perks, but I had specific builds in mind and was okay with my choices planning for the future instead of right now. But just as we were stepping foot into the snow, moments from finishing the quest, some barbarians rushed out from the tree line and attacked the caravan. It was seven thralls, and it was only us three and two caravan hands to pull through this ordeal somehow. Stuck in the snow with no way out, I gritted my teeth and tried to keep our strengths together and hoped the thralls wouldn't bunch up. Fortune was on our side since the trees split our starting caravan in two, and the dim-witted thralls went donkey murder crazy as three of them split off south. We were doing well with our chosen foes on the road, but I couldn't say the same for the weaker of the two caravan hands. The better equipped one surprised me by claiming a kill, but we couldn't celebrate just yet as there were three thralls left. I tried my best to separate them and focus them down, but Enrique was taking hit after hit. I did the last Hail Mary shield bash to distance the thrall from Enrique's bloody and injured self. It worked, and Enrique's escaped to the safety of the road. I sincerely hoped that the low number of thralls would goad them into fleeing this fight, but I couldn't be more wrong. The other spear wielder skewered the last remaining caravan hand, and the shield bashed one rushed Katarina. 3v2, and we were looking pretty badly bruised at the moment. I had to reinstate Enrique, risking him for the sake of the party's survival. We acted first. Multiple hits brought the thrall low, and and very injured but not dead yet. His turn and his attack sails true, even with accuracy reducing injuries. A 36 but by sheer luck he hit Enrique's still armored head instead of his bare chest. The chance to hit head with most weapons is 25% so this was super lucky, even though it was still very unlucky. With the other thrall engrossed in donkey murder, the party survived by the skin of their teeth and saved the caravan, even if it was just a single remaining donkey. I was completely ecstatic that we had won with no personal losses. The XP and the loot was pretty good but all I could think of was how is it insane that Enrique, a level 5 bro with such secondhand armor could take 253 damage at this stage of the game and still survive somehow. All those extra points and HP certainly weren't wasted. In a panic, I camped to fix our bros, fearing the worst as another thrall attack could just be around the corner. Fortunately, my fears never manifested, and we reached the big city alive. Our employer cut a reward though because we brought him back only a single donkey and cart, but at least he got that much, a successful quest in our eyes. But when we walked into town, I was seriously questioning if every town water supply was laced with crazy pills, because they too were offering a four-star quest. If this world was that scary that they needed four-star quest help at this point, then they are successfully scaring me and my poor Inquisition. After camping the entire next day to recover from that insane thrall fight, our witch hunter theatered, MacGyvered an antidote from just one tooth, requires two normally. So I said thanks and questioned whether it would even work. Anyways, in the morning we sold the copper ingots and the bone figurines to help push our money to just over 2k. We bought a stack of tools and some food before taking a more appropriate quest, defending a caravan headed south. Sunny days and smooth sailing got us to the castle doorstep where a hanging was taking place. We were given the option, nay the opportunity, by some random old guy to elbow our way through the crowd to take some fingers and toes before they were all gone and be rewarded 500 bucks. If you have a thief in your party, an outlaw background of course, you can auto succeed this event, but since we didn't, I gambled and lost and even lost 343 crowns in the process as the kerfuffle happened and our coin first was missing after it all died down. Drat! There goes our profits on some weird old man's gamble. I swear I don't gamble in real life, but this game gets to me somehow, you know? Anyways, quest complete and the castle had some nice armor and helmet upgrades for sale, so we spent most of our remaining cash on improving our combat survivability. But now we were poor again and needed more quests. Back south 
we go. Crap, there's no way. Oh, hello there. Day 26, and up from the gurgling depths, two swamp unholds run along to the road and try and chase us down. I'm 100% out of there as soon as possible. Back to the castle, I hid beside the noble army. And when I went back to the road, the unholds were gone. Phew, that's a relief. At this stage, only noble armies are truly prepared for unhold fights, and abusing their hospitality is a no-brainer here. Continuing south, we saw some rabble running towards us and accepted the fight instead of running. Definitely a better alternative. Keeping Enrique on the flank was yet again not the best decision. We dealt with the rabble quite well, but Enrique took another 192 damage for staying on the front lines with minus 2 base defense. 184 crowns as loot was nice, but I truly hope this party size can increase soon. Theater had reached level 6 and was really becoming quite the ranged prodigy. It does look like I'm completely wasting his talents and having inefficient party usage with him on the front lines, but sadly this game isn't kind to early game ranged bros, and having only two other bros to keep a helpless ranged bro safe is not ideal. We grabbed the double strike perk with his new level and walked right into another rabble ambush. I mean, it can't complain per se. Fairly easy fights, XP that walks right to our doorstep. Pretty good, right? Only real concern is that we didn't have enough time to fully heal and repair from our last encounter. It was 3 versus 11 and I had to be a bit careful. Attempting to protect Enrique in the center, we quickly felled the guitar rabble. Two more kills and I was slowly rotating us south as we tried to huddle together. However, two 37s in a row and Theater was the one looking worse for wear. And one more hit and he was down, but he wasn't dead and we were super lucky that he just got struck down. Maybe a permanent injury will cripple him beyond repair, but right now we had other problems to worry about. Two versus seven and we had a ways to go. Enrique takes two more hits and he's also hanging by a thread. A kill and Katarina's spear helps shatter the enemy's resolve, but there's still those who want to fight. The melee rabble gets cut down and it's a 2v2. The ranged enemies won't flee and let us win the fight. If any unlucky hit connects, there will be pain. Fortunately, the hit that does connect doesn't do enough damage to take Enrique out and the fight is ours. Even more glorious is the fact that our surviving bro theater has gained the best permanent injury in the game. Brain damage! Now technically permanent injuries aren't good for your bros and brain damage still has the bad effects of reduced experience gain and reduced initiative, but the brain damage is one of the only two permanent injuries to give a substantial bonus to your bro. Specifically, it gives 15% resolve as your bro isn't smart enough anymore to notice or process the dangers of the world. This is rather helpful in realizing a bunch of backgrounds in this game suffer from low resolve stats and it's a nice boost in most situations. Even more so, we're playing with the Inquisition Origin and extra resolve just boosts mind over body even further. Nice. Katarina reaches level 6 and I make a bold play to grab Lone Wolf as her next perk. Usually a risk in most of my playthroughs as Lone Wolf doesn't work well in large parties, but I think this time we'll manage. A third rabble party chases our wounded Inquisition as soon as we leave the scene of the last battle. I'm seriously considering that the mere presence of the Spanish Inquisition just breeds haters or just draws out corruption from every shadow to us. After outrunning the rabble, we camp to the next day on the side of the road as we were desperate to patch up our bros. During our recovery, a kid wanders over and asks for help at a local blacksmith. A kid in need? Let's see how we can help. We successfully aid the child and are rewarded with multiple pieces of equipment being repaired for free. Once again, I would hate to think of what would happen if we failed. Once healed up, we check the village of Eisenheim for work but sadly find none worth our time. Ivanstadt, however, is a lovely seasonal fare but we can't utilize it this time. Alternatively, they're requesting that we deliver a car go east or defend a northbound caravan. I had my fair share of thralls for the while, so we took the delivery to Grubenheim. A hop, skip, and a jump away, the next morning we arrive at Grubenheim, quest complete. They request our assistance in finding a location, during which we successfully tame a wild dog, and the game automatically names it Battle Brother. Not the biggest fan of dogs in this game, and usually refer to them as free confidence for the enemy. However, it was just the three of us, and I'm sure I could use the help in a pickle. Literally moments later, I accidentally find the location way faster than expected, but don't complain as it was nice and easy cash. Oh, would you look at that, that was the eighth quest to complete our ambition and we were rewarded with some renown. Nice. Now we get to choose a new one. Not great choices, but a battle standard's a decent weapon even if it'll cost us a thousand coins in the end. Completing ambitions is good as we still want to increase that party size. I thought we may have been reaching the threshold by now, but we were only on 473. So close to 500, but it would take a little more to expand the party. We passed by Eisenheim the next day, but they didn't have anything for us. Reaching Ivanstadt, we noticed they had followed the tracks for us, but we didn't have their gear fully repaired and we were out of tools. I used an unconventional method to fix this problem, as their tools were literally selling for 500 bucks when you usually can buy them for 200. My ingenious idea was to buy some of their cheapest and crappiest items and salvage them for the little amount of tools required to get us combat ready. A shiv, two bandanas, and a wooden spear was just enough to fix our gear. Thank goodness for that, and it only costed 39 bucks to do so. Still out of tools for next time, but that's for future snow to deal with. We caught up to the rabble and tried to huddle near a tree for safety in another 3v9 fight, though instant regret was my reward, as Theatred got pummeled twice by the hammer rabble and lost all of his body armor, leaving him very vulnerable. I was learning the hard way that some rabble were scared
scarier than most, and putting two and two together should have been an easy task, as Legends already has a blacksmith enemy who's a pain even in late game to strip your armor. These new rabble were basically blacksmiths, but in the early game. From here on, I was definitely having those hammer rabble on the top of my kill list. Fortunately, three swift kills at the end of round two swung the rest of the fight in our favor as we retreated the Adderd, whilst Enrique and Katarina off the floor with the criminals. No tools to fix the pain, but the leftover equipment from our foes would do the job just fine. Enrique reached level six, and we grabbed a double strike to boost his damage potential. Quest complete, but it only got us to 497 renown. One more, and we could break free from the struggles of a small party. Because we were damaged from that last fight, we still had to camp to the next day to keep on top of it all. But even after hanging around the big city for another day, it still wasn't enough time for them to refresh their quests, so we headed south to Goldhoft, a quick find a location quest located in Necromancer Lair. But what was more important was the quest completion brought us finally to the threshold of increasing the party size. Yes! 33 full days of agonizing pain of keeping three bros alive in constant fights of 1v3, 1v4 odds against us. With only one struck down in this time period, I was proud of how far we'd come. It wasn't over yet though as I had to look for someone to recruit, because remember, no outlaws. Yikes. But why worry about those things when the literal first recruit we see is a keeper? A miner named Ingyald, a peculiar combination of 5 melee skill from Dexterous and minus 5 skill from Brute, but ended up with decent stats all around, so a good pickup indeed. I figured he'd make a good pickaxe build, so I prepared his perks in advance and I geared up with a spear to help him in his early levels. Copper ingots were cheap again, so we grabbed them both and headed southwest to find more work. The next day we reached the village of Gemenstein and found them to be in rather bad condition. They had a three-star request for beasts and I respectfully declined whilst taking yet another follow the tracks quest. Truly one of the most reliable human enemy quests that caters to the early game and parties down on their luck trying to rebuild. I just can't say no to these quests. Just before we get to the thieves, the adder approached me and has another pained look on his face. I'm not super worried, the last time our lovely high health flagellant was barely affected by his own hands. However, this time he went a bit too far and gave himself a temporary injury, an injured shoulder. Negative 25% damage inflicted. Not the end of the world, but Enrique really has to understand that he gets enough pain from his enemies at this point. He's even rivaling my own masochism, and there's no question he'd play legendary difficulty too if given the chance. After treating the injury while camping, we soldiered on and put our new bro Ingyald through the initiation process, trial by follow the tracks, to join our Inquisition. 4v9 for the first time ever, and it was quite the breezy initiation. An 11% stun was the first thing our new miner felt in our company. But with decent positioning and minimal damage received, we finished the fight in just seven rounds with Ingyal taking no damage and picking up three kills to boot, the most out of anyone in the fight. He passed the test with fine colors and was one of us now. A ballsy necromancer approached us and tried to make some excuses as to why he needed this stolen idol of fertility. I have literally no idea why he'd want such a thing. You know what? Let's let's not go there. We instead returned this idol to its rightful owner and immediately set off to continue questing. We took a quick detour as we camped till morning outside the Mountain Bailey of Termwat. Now we can't get quests here till we become professionals and catch the noble house's eyes, but the mini castle per se can sometimes have good recruits. Never mind, that's a day tailor. Back to Ivan's stat we go, the big city has quickly become my favorite settlement as they've taken such good care of us thus far. Copper ingots sold for a good profit and we check the recruits and find the cheapest hedge knight I've ever seen. Four free levels included. 2.6k is a literal steal for this dude, but we're not rich enough and we don't have any way of getting him into our ranks. However, we do find a tanky apprentice, Alric. Craven as he may be, he's also tiny and I'm happy to employ a defensive frontliner to eventually give our poor backliner Enrique a break. A couple upgrades from the marketplace left me confident in our bro's equipment, but also left us at 600 coins. So we were happy to take and probably didn't have much of a choice in taking a caravan two days to the north. Camping our hearts out, we found goblins on the road and they took an interest in our group. Three skirmishers and an ambusher seems like a small threat, but goblins are a very big threat to low-level bros. We rushed to try and kill the spear user whilst ignoring the chain user as he wasn't much of a threat. Luckily, the dagger goblin wasted his net on Katarina as Enrique one-shotted the spear goblin with a spear thrust to the face. Alric got his first kill by skewering the chain goblin with his pitchfork whilst the caravan hand sat back and enjoyed becoming the ambusher's pincushion. Enrique demolished the dagger goblin as we easily cleaned up the ambusher afterwards. A slightly different initiation for Alric was complete. Not much loot to speak of, but Ingyal got to level 2 and it was a no-brainer we grabbed or hunter and immediately switched from the spear to the pickaxe. Now, I think I mentioned this last time, but Legends has helped keep some early game weapons more relevant to mid and somewhat relevant to late game, specifically in the form of weapon specialists. Miners commonly have access to the pickaxe specialty, and with the use of two perks, can become quite the force on the battlefield, accurately stripping armor off of foes with such a cheap weapon. There are a few other weapons in the game that you can specialize in, however, I don't make these builds often, so at least we can enjoy this one for now. Day 38 in the Inquisition found a nice gentleman who could support our righteous cause. I didn't say he was willing, I said he was able to. With a quick convincing, the drunken nobleman's furs and rings were ours, and all in a day's work, you see. No other supporters were found on the rest of our journey as we pulled into Shan's Moor shortly after. 192 crowns, 82 XP, and 34 meds, not bad for a fairly safe trip. It was enough to get Alaric to level 2 with the student perk. Another Mott and Bailey, no quests, so back south we went to grab more quests. But as the morning broke, I noticed tracks leading off the beaten path. Curious, I followed them and spotted some brigand hunters as the producer of said tracks. Weighing the risk, I jumped into a broad daylight fight against a ranged oriented team of enemies. Not the smartest choice, but let me check the script. It says here I did it because I wanted more XP. Well, you can't argue with that reasoning. We got rushed by the 
the dogs immediately and had four ranged enemies firing upon us every turn. Specifically, three of them were bows, and bows are worse to deal with than slings in the early game because they hurt more and are more accurate. The dogs went down as quickly as they rushed us, and we had to rotate a bit as the melee rabble were trying to flank the south. This left the battlefield wide open as I rushed the ranged foes with the adder to stop those arrows as soon as possible. He engaged two of them, but the other two were still shooting, even as the melee rabble fell at our party's hands. I had the crazy idea of utilizing our new member, Mr. Battle Brother himself, the dog we just saved, and Enrique set him loose on our foes. Now there was only one archer left firing. Oh no, Battle Brother took a 12% dagger to the face and was left on 19 HP. Oh, never mind. In two big swift bites, Battle Brother tore through the rabble poacher and he was dead. Our dog's first solo kill. The fight was over and the XP received was enough to level up Ingyald. A good enough excuse to justify my reasoning to take this fight. Yes, of course. Level 3 and we grabbed Balance, the first of the medium armor tree perks. Since we had very light armor, he was only getting plus 4 melee defense, but I was definitely not complaining about free stats. Back at Eisenheim and why, just why, did these towns need 4 star quests this early in the game? No way, I was out of there. Bad omens, I tell you, bad omens. On the other hand, a big city of Ivanstadt had no quests available. At least they were liking us enough to buy our legally acquired ring and fur for a nice price. A quick glance at the recruits before we left and you have got to be kidding me. An even cheaper Hedge Knight was on offer, 1.9k and I was fuming. This map was completely trolling us and I had stormed out of town wondering how the heck these abnormalities were happening. Night fell and at least Goldhoff was offering us a nice caravan quest which I happily took. With the free time on our hands we salvaged, healed and even trained a bit. Ah, goblins. Didn't see that coming. Okay, five skirmishers, melee goblins with throwing weapons. Not a good lineup for us. I had to be very careful here. We could take some serious damage. Popping our pitchfork, Alaric, on the high ground, I tried to rush the net wielder before he could throw it. Since this failed immediately, I panicked and Enrique released Battle Brother, our loyal dog, out in front of two goblins, expecting to never see him again. Instantly, the dog took a small bite out of the net skirmisher, but lost 37 hit points immediately afterwards and was left on 13 HP. He was a good little distraction. We knew him well. Round two, Theater took a couple big hits and a third goblin surrounded the dog. I had already said my goodbyes and made peace. The adder was still getting hit, Ingyal connected his pick with the goblin's face, and even though our pitchfork strategy failed, as Alaric couldn't hit the side of a barn, Enrique claimed first blood to boost our confidence. Round three, the dog whiffs two 14% and they were sure to be his last. As expected, the goblins ignored him. Wait, what? One gigantic slash to a dog, and somehow he's of no further interest. This was very weird, but at least our dog was somehow surviving right now. The alternative was the adder being dropped to 5 HP, so I don't know if I should be happy or sad at this point. But luckily, our next volley of attacks rang true, and even with the cut arm sinew, Theatred felled the goblin that had given him so much pain. With all the goblins engaged in melee, no, we were chanced on a 56 by the crafty and evil AI, as the goblin with the throwing bowl is footworked out of melee to try and end Theatred once and for all. Enemies with footwork have always been so unpredictable in the game, and I've lost too many bros in the past where the AI's chest-like brain has found the perfect footwork into a snipe kill again and again. Not this time, AI. Theatred retreated to the caravan, and the rest of the goblins are cleaned up with none of them ever thinking of touching the dog ever again. Fancy that. Footwork into murderous intent on our bro, but dog on 13 HP? Nah, not even a passing thought. Scary fight over, we got some bolas and good weapons as compensation for our pains, even enough XP to get Alaric to level 3. We then proceeded to heal up as we were looking pretty bad, and add injury to injury, Theatred cut his arm whilst training. Ouch. Night fell as we were just passing Eisenham, and an old man was mouthing off and dragging a young man by the ear. Offloaded the youth to us and said something about the kid being an impatient fencing student, and that if he wanted to fight so bad he should join a mercenary company. Great teaching tactics, I know. Anyways, of course I said yes, it was a free recruit. The apprentice was a diamond in the rough and she had great melee stats, just what we needed. And just like that, Femk, although I thought it was Femke, so if you watch the VODs you can enjoy me butchering even more names than here. Femk joined the party, went with a one-handed build, and then finally remembered to give Alaric his level up. Gifted was a great choice and the scat skyrocketed. The caravan continued without a hitch as we arrived at Grubenheim the next day. Katarina leveled up from the quest XP as we grabbed Underdog, a great defensive perk that would surely come in handy. An undead location had me thinking for a second, but ultimately chose another caravan to try and give our ragtag team a boost, and a better chance at a future survival. Risking undead this early might not be the wisest choice. We traveled north, training the whole way, and to further boost our self-improved efforts, Theatred had a great idea. He offered to personally train the new recruits to help them get up to speed. This event is wonderful and a no-brainer as you get free permanent stats for your bro. Teaching them to fight one-on-one, -on -one, Theatred had his three new protégés gain valuable permanent stats. Ingyald with two melee skill, Alric with two melee skill, and Femk with one melee defense. Very nice indeed. Perfect timing as the next morning we were ambushed by thralls. Definitely knew this was a risk going north, but we were ready. Only five enemies, not too bad. We rotated north and Ingyald grabbed our first kill rather quickly in round two. Katarina tanked three of them whilst the rest of the team bulldozed through the remaining thralls to end the fight with literally no damage taken. A flawless victory. This was quite the confidence booster and I was loving and proud of our full team of six. Femp got her first level and we grabbed the student perk as usual. I'm all about that push to late game power. Surprisingly, the wild and untamed North Wastelands gave us no more trouble as we safely arrived at Trogenshat the very next day. Since this was a decently long caravan and we trained the entire way, we accumulated roughly 500 XP for bros, a monumental effort from just a single quest, and we enjoyed four level ups. Ingyald reached level four and completed his pickaxe specialty with minor strikes 
becoming a true miner on the battlefield. I grabbed Fortified Mine for Theodred as I wasn't ready to go for Duelist at this stage. His shield was too useful in the small party. Plus, the extra resolve bonus pushed him to an insane 132 resolve and subsequent 33% reduction in fatigue costs because of mine over body. This combined multiplicatively with his throwing mastery of 25%, reducing his throwing attack fatigue costs to 8. Almost completely fatigue neutral. No easy feat as he was turning into quite the strong build. Alaric got to level 4 and we grabbed balance, but as usual the armor was enough to give him more than 3 defense for now. Femk also got level 3 and was enjoying the bonus stats from Gifted and was looking more and more reliable as a result. After quickly accepting and completing a final location quest, with the help of a mountain of course, we were paid to root out more corruption, specifically chasing down the slippery thieves. After following the tracks a short way, we engaged the rabble in a 6v10 the very next morning. Definitely more solid than we were used to, and I was confident in our party's abilities. Even though the snow slowed us down and Enrique got stunned a bit, the rabble fell rather easily. We successfully retrieved the stolen item, but before we could collect our pay, a different but equally dastardly necromancer offered us literally 70 extra bucks to betray our employer and give him the arcane tome of knowledge. We laughed in his face and returned to the town for our reward. The corrupt will never learn, and we will have to beat it into the crushable skulls so that they will truly learn to follow the righteous path. Upon returning, I noticed Femk reached level 4 and we grabbed Faint to help with any inaccurate attacks to assist her final build. Enrique also grew to reach level 7 and we grabbed Headhunter. Not super useful right now, but once again, I build for the future and if he gets there, it will be a crucial perk. Following the righteous path had rewarded us once again as the town offered us a new caravan quest just as we successfully returned the stolen item. Even better was the completion of our ambition for a battle standard. Can't believe we finally saved up 2k cash and now with the 1k purchase of a standard, we were a decent amount poor, but now we had a strong polearm weapon. We also had the thematic and psychological ability to fly our colors in battle and strike fear into the eyes of all who posed the right path. We chose the Rally the Troops ambition as I felt we could easily grab it on one of our high resolve bros. We didn't have a dedicated bannerman, but Theatred the Thrower was a bro we could hang back and rally the party with his insane resolve, even without a banner. Alaric was gifted the honor of flying our colors into battle and we set off south with the caravan with determination in our hearts. Day 46 and we got ambushed by more thralls. Five enemies and with our party growing stronger every day, I was not afraid of foes that temporarily stood before us. Funnily enough, some nearby peasants were dragged into the fight and our 17 strong force easily wiped the floor with our regret of full attackers. Some peasants got bruised in the kerfuffle but we grabbed all five kills in just five rounds. Piece of cake. We arrived safe and sound at the big city of Assested the very next day and since we trained the whole way we enjoyed roughly 300 experience for the whole team. Since you need more and more experience to reach each next level, the next speed drop didn't result in any level ups this time. We camped until evening as we had to fix a training injury and salvage some gear for inventory space. I probably didn't mention this up until now, but inventory space is not a static component in Legends mod. Each bro provides their own contribution to increasing the party's inventory space, and certain backgrounds are better than others. Back when we had three bros, we only had 22 space for holding our loot, foods, and spare equipment. That's really not a lot of workable space in this game. Now we had three more bros and were able to get our inventory space up to 36. Still not that great. Other than relying on good inventory bros, you can always start the game on an easier funds difficulty to have more space. Or during a run, you can also spend money on upgrading your party's cart. It's 5k for the first upgrade, 10 for the next, 20 for the one after that. So sadly, that was out of the question, and we were just going to have to manage the 36 spaces for now. Ultimately, there was not much up here in the north for us, so it was nice to grab the next caravan headed three days southeast to Grubenheim. The next day was nice and peaceful, but at the stroke of midnight, I wasn't paying attention and got ambushed by something. Unsurprisingly, it was thralls, but I was actually worried because it was 11 enemies. They even got the early high ground, so I tried to huddle together with haphazard formation. Since the Adderd was using throwing weapons now, he needed to be behind our front line. Katarina had Lone Wolf, so I sent her to the south as I knew she'd be fine on her own. However, my lack of proper formation and the outnumber situation produced some problems. Femp took some unlucky javelins in the dark, and her armor and health were shredded. Melee thralls also easily ran past our front line, and one was in the face of our now fragile Fremp. The silver lining was that the dog rushed the caravan hands and dragged them into the fight. Now Theodred was in melee as a ranged character. Since I kept a shield on him, my caution was well rewarded, and he was able to save Fem from her predicament with a successful shield bash. Now freed and badly bloodied, Fem hid behind the carts in the donkeys, whilst I had to manage the rest of this fight with one less person. Round 3 and a sneaky rotating thrall duo cut down the brave caravan hand, but luckily we already reached both of them to death's door and Enrique swiftly got a double kill. Theodred also got his first double kill with throwing bolas. Ingyald took three scary hits to the face, a 35%, a 22%, and a 25%, which stripped all of his helmet armor, leaving his face rather vulnerable. Triple headshot, super unlucky and dangerous. Down to five enemies, it wasn't hard to stagger the thralls and clean up the fight. But disaster struck as Inyol was ultimately cursed by RNG. A 58 spear to the chest set up a decapitating double 19% by the cleaver thrall on death's door. You cannot get this unlucky and survive in this game. I was rightfully upset at this seriously unlucky development. So many headshots and this guy did not deserve to die. We finished the fight shortly after but felt numb at our loss and couldn't fully enjoy the defeat of such a large number of thralls. Trying not to think about our current situation, we pressed on training but regretted the decision to not repair and heal up after the rough fight as the next day a party of rabble decided to rub salt in our wounds by ambushing our caravan. Normally I'm not scared of such fights but I was actually worried because of the bad shape we were currently in. I didn't want to get into a 
death spiral. Not now. Not this way. The dog rushed us and was converted into free confidence for our bros. The javelin insta-kill from Theatred and his second throw left the other rabble on 2 HP. We needed to finish this fight fast. Katarina removed the last two points of damage needed and it with 1v10 was swiftly reduced to a 1v7 by the start of round 2. This, along with some good rolls and placements of our wounded bros, led the battle into a flawless victory as we received no damage at all from our foes. Alaric got to level 5 as a result and we grabbed Resilient to boost his HP and survivability. I snapped back to it and stopped the training camp to try and heal our bros and repair our gear. But first, Katarina leveled up as the result of the training exercise, which was nice as she was now level 8 and getting rather strong. Being up Killing Frenzy would push her damage even further as our flanking lone wolf. Femk also advanced a level and grabbed a flail mastery in hopes that we will get a flail in the future for her late game build. Healing and repairing was the correct choice as it got us back to full fighting force by the next day where we predictably got attacked yet again. This time it was different. We were now dealing with the next level of brigand enemies, thugs. There are painful bunches that armor and weapons are rather hard to deal with for early game parties. However, I was confident in our bros capabilities, not overconfident as there were literally 15 enemies, but since we could manage thralls on a good day, I was sure we could handle thugs. Due to us being outnumbered though, I left Katarina to dominate the south flank while the rest northated north to hopefully let the caravan hands engage and assist. Our bros accurately and swiftly took names and numbers as the brigands were meticulously cut down across the battlefield. This was definitely not a thrall fight and it showed. Minimal damage taken across the team and brigands were wiped out in 8 rounds. The adder got 5 kills with his throwing weapons and also did over 500 damage. The loot was rather nice. 136 crowns and some spare salvageables was a nice reward on top of the 300-ish XP. Too many fights in a row and our now 28 slot inventory meant a lot of loot was going to waste as we had to leave it behind. However, literally hours later down the road we yet again got another ambush by more thugs. This was our fourth ambush along the same caravan and was getting ridiculous at this point. 16 enemies but the fight was just as simple and easy as the last one. Minimal damage was taken as the thugs and rabble tried to flank on their way to murder the donkeys. We didn't have to worry much about formation as they spread out nice and easily and we cut them down in just seven rounds. But I was happier with this fight because we got a nice peasant flail drop as a result. It was the end of day 50, halfway through the run, and I was feeling rather confident and proud of our accomplishments with this tricky origin. As stated previously, the starting equipment was rough to get past, but other than the super unlucky death with Alaric, we had done quite a good job of building this company up from almost nothing. We're currently sitting on five abled bros. One level eight, two level sevens, and two level fives. Not too shabby. The bros are successfully cleaving through thugs and thralls alike, and that's all you could hope for at this point. I'm even confident we could start hitting raiders rather effectively with a bit of caution and care, of course. Money is sitting comfortably at 1.2k, but I do worry that we're not making enough as we don't have the capabilities to buy stronger weapons at this point, and since we aren't fighting raiders, we're not actually getting upgrades from enemy drops. Basically, my main concern at this stage is we'll be fighting rabble for too long and meet raiders too late. The game goes on without you, and if their numbers are too much, we may not have the strength to beat them. Getting some lucky raider kills early can net some nice free weapons and armor upgrades, and sadly we haven't had any of that yet. Regardless of the mid playthrough concerns, we pressed on and completed the caravan the next day, finally with no more ambushes. It was at this stage of the game I started to focus on cleansing the undead. The Inquisition had gone after murderers, thieves, and denied the occasional necromancer their coveted possession, but I felt as the party was ready for some zombies, so I said yes to Grubenheim's request to clear out the unearthed tomb. A quick camper repair and salvage before we left, and oh come on, why another ambush? Nine tier one knocks had the bright idea of inviting us over for lunch. Since they were just tier ones, I wasn't super scared and focused on huddling together at the top of the cliff where we spawned. Allowing ourselves to be surrounded and holding off on kills, we took the risk of taking a little bit of damage before we told the trigger. It's a risky but effective tactic with only one mistake leading to a single corpse consumption at the end of the fight. We flattened those monsters like clockwork and with only Ernreek taking 100 damage as part of the risk. Do remember, he has a bro with minus 2 base defense, 13 defense with the shield, and I'm still having him on the front line. Necessity demands him there, it's risky, but I need at least someone up there taking the hits. Well, a little camping later and we were ready to purge some undead the next morning. Into the swamp we went, the worst terrain ever, but since it was a location fight there was no horrible murky water. Phew. But the actual problem to worry about was we were outnumbered almost 3 to 1, and I wasn't looking forward to being surrounded and having our backliners come face to face with those shambling horrors. So I tactically retreated to some trees and graves and set up a rather nice bottleneck formation. From here we let Katarina do her lone wolf thing and even though she was surrounded by five zombies for most of it, we were able to keep on top of the horde and cut them down with just enough efficiency that we weren't overrun. Oh, and we only took 28 damage from the whole fight. Great formation, great positioning, and I was happy that the power of the team was finally showing through. 200 ish XP was good, but better than that was getting a lucky helmet drop. Zombies are a horrible source of loot, so it was nice to see something come our way. And Reek finally hit the magical level 8 milestone to reach the final tier of perks and you know we took muscular with no question on my mind. A nice damage boost for sure on our healthy bro. And with Theater hitting level 8 as well, we doubled up and also got in muscularity. Quest complete, and since the town was liking us more, we grabbed a couple of pieces of salt for a good price and headed out to search more quests. Day 53, and we were glad to see two quests available as we walked into the village of Eisenheim. The find a location quest was quick and easy to complete, however, I hesitated on their offer of a caravan three days north, as I was trying to focus more on this part of the map and work my ways towards cleansing the undead menace. Continuing on and then camping outside Ivanstadt, we were then able to sell our salt trophies and excess equipment at the marketplace to jump our cash stacks from 1.2k to 3.6. Nice. We then decided to grab the short caravan quest headed south.
southwest. Just as we left the city surrounds, away from prying eyes, an old man with quite the supportive ring on his finger, if you know what I mean, was found crossing our path along the road. He generously donated it to our righteous cause because he had no other choice, and we happily continued on our way. No more victims, I mean supporters, were found for the rest of the journey, and we safely strolled into the town of Gemenstein the very next day. They offered us even more salt for a good price, and I couldn't say no. However, we couldn't return the sentiment as we had no nets to help their nightmare problems. This map had no ports, no fishing villages, no reliable sorts of nets, and it was a sad struggle for us. We instead took a caravan back east to capitalize on more of these free camping opportunities. Simple and easy, another safe journey to add to the list of caravans we've protected, and even got two more levels as a result. Alric hit level 6 and learned the underdog trait, a no-brainer for a tank. Since Femk was advancing at the same rate, she also hit level 6 and grabbed underdog as well. Still a good trait for anyone on the front lines. Goldhoft was offering us a quest I don't normally take, but I felt defend the city from raiding parties wasn't a bad idea at this point, as I suspected we'd be encountering the opportunistic undead instead of thieving brigands. We got some free camping to train and increase our sight radius as we waited for the flies to enter our web. And sure enough, the next morning my prediction was correct. A fluke, of course, but it was good to see an opportunity to destroy some more undead. This time with some ghosts and a necromancer. Our prowess was sure to be tested here. We spawned on a hill in a 5v10 situation. This was looking good, but I had to find a way to disable the necro's resurrections and silence those geists before too much harm was done. See, there are different types of fights in this game, and even though all of the fights can simply be summed up as kill these enemies as soon as possible and kill them before they kill you, some fights are more revolved around big hitters or swarm tactics or attrition based tactics and a few other types as well. Necromancer fights are slightly based on swarm tactics but more so focus on attrition style fighting. They have the capabilities to infinitely resurrect the undead and with a geist in tow your morale will be constantly tested as you're slowly whittled down by the unrelenting corpses. Two ways to deal with this fight is usually fatalities to make sure the undead are unable to be resurrected, chopping heads works well, or going straight for the jugular engaging the necromancer in melee so he can't cast his spells. Sniping him with arrows works too, but we didn't have that kind of firepower. In any case, no matter your strategy, you should always have a bannerman with rally the troops before you even think of attempting the undead fights. Wait, what was that? Snow decided to be a ballsy idiot and not use his own recommendations? Yeah, well, do as I say, not as I do, am I right? No rally the troops here. We take decent positions on the high ground and the geists are kind enough to get close, but their screams are doing work as our white flags are flying higher and higher. The necro is continually resurrecting the zombies we put down, but at least Katarina has sliced the head off of her zombie, freeing her to be the solo SWAT team member to rush the necromancer. But before she can advance, Femp gives up the fight and is already fleeing. Not good. I put Katarina next to the guys to help as I'm realizing these ethereal beings are more dangerous than the resurrections for now. Luckily, necromancers can't resurrect guys, so Enrique's kill on the first guys is permanent. Femp gives piecing out as we try to manage the return in corpses, but now Alric has lost the will to fight. The last guys has to go. End of round six, and Femp comes to her senses, just as Katarina completes the mission to lock the necro in melee combat, finally interrupting the infinite resurrections. Fem flees once again. Alaric rallies, but it takes two more rounds till Enrique slices the geist into ectoplasmic pieces. With all the major threats dealt with and Katarina being a solid beast of a lone wolf bro, we easily clean up the fight by round 14. Like I said, attrition tactics, but knowing where and how to strike helps in this different style of fight, and we only took minor damage across the board this time. A great first necro and geist fight for sure. The loot was bad as usual, but we got paid almost a thousand bucks for our efforts, so this was a good boost for sure. Some camping to recuperate, and an old woman asks to read our fortune. Although hesitant in case of witchcraft, I say yes, but the crazy woman is actually a witch, and she tries to assassinate me, but she's not really a fighter, so we easily slay her and burn her body. The corruption in these lands truly runs deeper than I could imagine. Even random old ladies can't be trusted. We return to Ivanstadt to realize they too are working the same goals as more witch burnings were happening. We checked for some recruits as our party size increased once again, and our money was doing better after selling our goods for 2k. However, no recruit piqued our interest, and and since we didn't want a delivery quest, we headed east, hoping the eastern villages had refreshed their stock of quests. It was day 58, and Eisenheim was asking for a delivery. We had to say yes, as there was not much else around. However, before we left, the village had a very nice militia that wasn't too expensive. Since we had some expendable income, we recruited him, and were immediately more than satisfied with our decision. Our glorious moustached new comrade, Frithanoth, Frithan, Frithuthan, Frithanoth? Never mind, we'll just call him Frith. Why does this game have such difficult words? Or maybe I'm just that bad at pronouncing them. Or maybe it's both. Regardless, he was a wonderful statted bro and potential to be a two-handed sword user, and I was happy to have another good frontliner in the group. The delivery north was going well, and along the way, we stopped outside the castle of Totterberg to camp for a bit and see if their markets and recruits had anything in store for us. Sadly, nothing was good in our price range, so we continued our delivery north. Right before we were set to arrive, two barbarian parties tried to pincer attack us in the same ambush spot that hit us in the past. Luckily, they were slow to react and we slipped by to the big city of Trogenstadt. But I wasn't feeling safe, and if they both caught up to us, it would be 
death. The town offered a caravan back south, but with those two barbarian parties lurking in the woods, it would have been a suicide mission. However, a gigantic stroke of luck, a supply caravan, well defended with nobles, was just leaving south from the city, and I immediately huddled close to it and used it as a deterrent or support if we were ever attacked. Funnily enough, the barbarians must have saw a squirrel and got distracted, and left as they were not there as we passed the ambush point on the way south. But that didn't stop me from following closely to the supply caravan back to Totterberg, and then parting ways as I continued south. We had met a band of entertainers and jugglers and were pleased with their generous donation to the cause. Despite the horrible corruption in this land, it was always nice to see so many people come forth to aid us on our journey. Lights in the dark, I say. Just after that, we were reunited with the past horror. The two swamp on holds, they were still alive and well and roaming the streets. If you don't see something die with your own two eyes in this game, it's foolish to assume they're dead. I tried dragging them into a mercenary defended supply caravan, but it didn't succeed. So off we fled south, hopefully having someone else deal with that menace. Later that day, brigands chased us down and I happily led them into a fight along the roads instead of the forest. Seventeen enemies seemed like a lot, practically a 3v1, but we were expert brigand slayers at this point and thieves had no effect on our crew of justice. With low defense, Enrique took a couple small hits, but the fight was no sweat as we cleaved through multiple brigands per round, ending the fight in just six rounds. The brothers were doing well indeed. 175 crowns, decent loot, and we were also rewarded with two level ups. Katarina, now at level 9, was enjoying a new boost to resolve with Fortified Mind, while Frith was just happy to reach level 2 and get crippling strikes to start his journey. Day 61 and we rested, repaired, and healed at Eisenstein before we decided to vanquish a brigand hideout for some pay, of course. Due to brigands usually having annoying ranged combatants, we attacked under the cover of darkness, but RNG had other plans. As it so happened, a brigand leader was visiting the camp at this very moment, and we had to engage a foe that was definitely above our pay grade and power level. Not good. Oh, and there's a 20% of this actually happening, so yikes. 6 vs 14, but I just focused on that one leader. Katarina seemed like the only answer to the problem, but if that leader found a way to anybody else, I'm not confident they'd handle him well. Regardless, we got stuck in it, almost fell two thugs in the first round. Round two and Gerald the Smug showed his face on our top flank. Not good. Katarina was on the south flank. Darn AIs exploiting your weakest flanks. A couple of dead thugs allowed me to push Katarina more north, but Gerald just danced back to try and take advantage of the hole I just made in my south flank. Now as annoying as this specific AI tactic is, I was actually playing chess while the brigands were still learning checkers. Especially in bigger fights, strong enemies can be late to join the fight, and enemies in general will try and do predictable tactics, like grabbing high ground, rushing low defense bros and archers, and also trying their best to flank. If you can keep juggling which side of your army is the weakest flank, it will delay the engagement of the foes focusing on achieving the perfect flanking maneuver, ultimately staggering the enemy force into smaller and more manageable waves. Unfortunately, I got cocky and forgot to rotate Katarina back to the south flank, and Gerald dashed to the flank and engaged our new vulnerable bro, Femp. However, I wasn't completely panicked, as the multiple kills we already had gotten had pushed Gerald's morale to the breaking point, and all it took was two javelins to push him over the edge into complete and utter fear. Obviously, if I played perfectly, we wouldn't have risked Femp's life, but it all worked out in the end. Gerald eventually fell, and the brigands were defeated. An unexpected but confidence boosting fight nonetheless as well, and we also got Gerald's sword amongst the nice dash of loot, amber shards, and 143 crowns. Firth reached level 3 and we grabbed Bloody Harvest to boost his future AoE attacks when and if we got to his final build. We cashed in the quest the next morning and the bonus cash from the leaders had totaled almost 1400 crowns in our pocket. Nice. Back to old reliable Ivanstat to sell our excessive gear and shards, but I accepted to follow the tracks quest before selling the gear and went into a fight with a moderately full inventory. Whoops. 6 vs 16, but you know it by now. The party was pretty good. Having thugs as the strongest resistance to our blades was not enough to provide a threat above a few unlucky hits going our way. Obviously, Enrique got stunned, but we still cleaned up the fight in only five rounds. We turned the quest in, and for the fun of it, I went and engaged the undead location just outside of town. Maybe I was too bold and just didn't realize it was full of so many knocks and zombies, 16 in total. A healthy retreat to the two nearby points of high ground and helpful trees, we made our stand. With so many tier one knocks and our bunched up tactics, I was obviously worried about the corpse management and how we didn't have much formation flexibility with our small party. Katarina on her own tanked fine and distracted five of the foes, leaving eleven for the rest of us. I did a very risky play of putting Enrique forward to soak up the attention of more Nox. Luckily, we were able to stagger and control the kills as well, and some of the Nox are fleeing by round four. With good timing and walking on corpses, not a single Nox had a chance to eat. No one but Enrique took much damage, and the fight was ours. We returned to town victorious, sadly not paid for efforts, but at least we got two level ups. Alric level seven grabbed Lithe, the damage reduction perk in the medium armor group. Femp, also level seven, grabbed Duelist not super useful now, but I hope we can get her to utilize her full build. With the big city exhausted for now, we headed west to Termwatt the next day in hopes of buying an endgame weapon for our team. The map wasn't super great, and weaponsmiths were not exactly common or near where we were currently residing. We went in with a shopping list specifically wanting a two-handed melee flail and a two-handed reach flail, but were saddened to see none available. Since we had to get something to strengthen the party, we grabbed one of my favorite weapons, the three-headed flail for 3k. Half our cash gone in an instant, but totally worth it. This weapon can do numbers in the right hands. And the right hands in this situation was Femk. As a duelist, she was ready to use 
use this new beauty in combat, of course double gripping it without a shield to make the most of her damage potential and perks. Having 31 defense at level 7 without a shield, she was more than ready to accept this new role in the squad. The development actually let Enrique finally switch places in armor to be placed safely on the back ranks with a reach flail and was now starting to utilize his proper build as well. This purchase was a great step in the right direction for the party. Eric donned the jester hat and we were set off to find more work and test our increased strength. I had been playing for six and a half hours straight, so I took a break. And luckily I did, or I'd have missed my hockey game. The next IRL day, we picked up the Hex quest and couldn't shy away from cleansing one of the most dominating and controlling forms of corruption this world has to offer. We had to protect the mayor's firstborn son from the clutches of a Hex and her entourage, specifically a few dire wolves, a marksman, and a tier 2 knock. Not that bad, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Hexes are almost always protected by frenzied dire wolves, a very deadly enemy that are miles above a normal dire wolf's capabilities. Three attacks per turn overwhelm and nimble and their killers for early to mid parties. However, surprisingly, she only had one, and with luck and patience, we actually cleaned up quite well. The swap of Enrique to the back rank had him doing more DPS from a safe distance, and Femk, able to 1v1 the normal dire wolf, had no damage taken despite being on the low ground. Only our new recruit Firth fell for the Hex's OnlyFans plug once, and we forgave him shortly after the Hex was lying in her own pool of blood. A good result to an otherwise risky fight and having your main damage dealers turn on your bros is quite a devastating turn of events that can cascade a party to many injuries and even losses in such a fight. Despite the betrayal of Frith during the fight, we got him to level 4 and grabbed Brawny in anticipation of him wearing heavy armor in the future. We also got paid 1.4k for our successful efforts and we're happy another source of corruption was added to our kill feed. We camped for some healing and repairing until the morning and I remembered I could help reduce inventory space clutter by doing some crafting. The knock teeth and horns we had collected up to this point could be crafted into necklaces. Could have saved some space by doing this earlier, but we camped until the next day to produce our first crafted item and equipped it on Katarina to help her when she needed to solo enemies. We headed back to Goldhof the next day and grabbed their copper and get some food, and set off to find another tomb location and get paid doing so. An easy task with the nearby mountains, but since they had nothing else for us, it was back to reliable Ivanstadt. We arrived as dawn broke and immediately sold the ingots for a profit. They had a delivery quest for us, but it was too far for my liking. Off to Eisenheim then, and even though it wasn't much, a Follow the Tracks quest was a paid source of XP. It was as if these thieves were nothing to us now. Rabble and thugs were like butter to our knives, and we took very minimal damage dispatching them in just four rounds. Day 68 in Grubenheim was the last stop in our cul-de-sac of quest-giving towns. It was surprising to see yet another four-star quest on offer, and even though I was confident in our bros, and how far they've come, I was not that confident or insane, and definitely didn't want to risk the whole run on this. So with no other quests to take, we made our path down to the undead locations past the mountains where we previously scouted. In the dark, we raided the abandoned homestead known as the Greedy Hearts Hideout. Greeting us were some zombies and geists amounting to 11 enemies in total. I had to act fast. And two rounds in, my fears were correct. It was five ghosts in total. That's a lot of screams. Luckily, Femk was up for the task. The triple attack three-headed flail had the best chance of hitting a one HP geist eventually. The first swing of her flail, the ectoplasm was scattered across the floor, leaving only four transparent figures to scream at us. I knew we needed help here, and Battle Brother was a good distraction for screams, and maybe a chance to take down a ghost. Uh, nope. He just got screamed at, and the puppy was out of there. At least he absorbed some screams. Another ghost felled by Femk, another by Katarina's successful flank, but now we had half the party and the dog in a full horrific retreat. Just before things could get nasty, Enrique brought down the second to last ghost and Katarina exercised the final one. The last of the zombies were easily beaten and we conquered yet another undead location. The Silver Spoons was a nice monetizable reward, but Enrique's advancement to level 9 was what I was keen on. Better stats, and now we had Berserk, bonus action points on a kill to keep the damage coming. We fixed our gear and healed up as we camped until the sun rose, and I was ready for another fight. The Monument to Hopelessness, a Necromancer's Lair, was my next target. I was feeling bold after camping till daybreak on day 70 and we assaulted the crypt. But as soon as we entered, I realized the horrifying sight before us. I advanced Alric two spaces to scout the enemy to find a 17-strong and undaunting force of rotting flesh, but most of them weren't your average biting and scratching shamblers. We were in the presence of armored zombies. I had realized my mistake. With full knowledge of a necromancer backing the efforts of these stronger zombies, I had no choice but to retreat. This was truly too much to overcome, and would need some miracle to deal with the flood of resurrecting and possessed zombies. I tried to manually retreat the team, but Alric was constantly taking unlucky hits, slowing his progress and the zombies were gaining. I had no choice but to hit that white flag as we watched in horror as the necromancer slowly added another body to his army. There goes our level 7 tank. He didn't deserve to go out this way and I vowed to return with the full force by day 100 to enact my revenge on this abomination. I had my goal and we had 30 days to destroy these necromancer lairs or die trying because there was a second one nearby. It was probably just as scary and deserved to go. With tails between our justice bound legs, we ran to Goldenhof to start our training jury and prep for the final fight. Everything from now on was solely home to our new cause. Three star defend the city was too much right now as we checked Ivan's stat for something more manageable. We camped till morning and took a caravan west. In the evening, Firth suggested we pillage the farmlands to support our new cause. I was tempted, but knew the support of the yellow faction was more valuable than 
some momentary looting. Morning, and the caravan was safely guided to the village of Gemenstein. We found a monk with great defensive potential and immediately had him fill the shoes of our recently fallen medium tank. This new medium tank, Blasi, didn't have the foggiest of his predecessor's predicament, but he was willing to help us with our revenge, and that's all I needed. Cheesing in the game once again, we pulled our quest group of Nox into a caravan and used the extra numbers to minimize the damage taken and to dominate this free source of cash and XP. Just a couple unlucky hits and not even a single caravan hand died whilst we took 9 of the 12 kills as loot for our crew. Theater had reached level 9 as a result and I finally gave in to the need for rally the troops as he now had a panic button to save our allies as a result. We had no more work here so I visited Termwatt to see if they refreshed their weapon stock and to hopefully grab another good one. Sadly no, nothing was in supply so we had to go elsewhere. Weapon upgrades would be 100% crucial for the final fights and we had to get them somehow or we would definitely struggle. I took a second to consider then hired a retired soldier with good defensive stars. This turned out to be a great decision as they were an amazing prospect for a tank build and thus Clothar joined the group as a second brand new tank. Definitely going to call them Clo for short. It had been some time since I tried to visit Strodorf and felt enough time had passed since it was dangerous. So we headed west and caught a small party of brigands at night. Two thugs, two raiders and it was a nice supply of new armors and weapons if we were lucky. I was too lazy to dagger them down and actually had no daggers on me. So I rolled the dice and easily beat them to a pulp and looted their corpses to find none of their weapons dropped but two new armors and helmets were now ours. In the morning some thugs challenged us and I dragged them into the mountains. Utilizing the high ground even our new level 1 bros found it easy to hold the tide back. Other than Femp kerning into a literal pin cushion with all those arrows, the rest of the team cleaned up rather nicely and the new bros really outdid themselves, holding off the top flank and even getting some kills as well. A ton of loot went to waste as our inventory size still sucked even with 7 bros in our employ. Blasi and Klo are two new tanks, both reached level 3, and after grabbing gifted on both, their stats were looking mighty fine for such low leveled bros. With the height of the mountain, we spotted some scary nomads and I didn't want to deal with this right now, so we trekked back a bit and camped to heal, repair, and salvage. With Theodred having rallied the troops, we finally completed our ambition and chained another completed ambition immediately afterwards by catching the eyes of the noble houses and unlocking the gold mine that is noble quest. We chose to destroy four undead locations at our next ambition even though I don't like the reward from it but it fitted very thematically with the run and it was hopefully going to be a part of our final goal. We returned to Termwatt to camp some more and when the markets opened the next day we bought another traveler's sash to increase our party's inventory space just a little bit more. Heading back west to hopefully take down the nomad leader for his gear we stumble upon a recognizable man sitting next to a hole with a captured alp. With no beast slayer in sight to help we managed to kill it less gracefully this time for a meager reward. Board. Just before town, some brigands were attacking a caravan. I let them finish because joining a fight spawns you at the edge of the map, and I'm too lazy to walk my entire team closer. So from sheer laziness, I let a caravan die so I could demolish the thugs myself. It was 17 enemies, but we huddled around a lovely spot of high ground where Enrique and Femp mowed down the evildoers whilst we barely took a scratch. I have good reasoning behind flails being my favorite weapons in this game, and these two are my avatars of destruction. Frith reached level 5, and we preemptively grabbed two-handed sword mastery, but I wasn't sure we could get one in time. We camped the night away to heal, repair, and salvage as usual. In the light of the 75th day, we got paid to chase down some Nox. 7v15 and I wasn't super worried, as long as that single tier 2 didn't eat anything. We wielded them down with ease, and some pretty decent bro placement got most of the Nox engaged without putting our bros in too much danger, or allowing them to eat. Job well done. After fighting so many Nox on our journey so far, we had even more teeth and horns than last time, which allowed us to spend a whole day crafting three new necklaces. I should have done the level ups first, but at the sight of empty inventory slots waiting to be filled with new loot was worth the delay. Four level ups from the last fight was a nice sight to see. Klo hit level four and got fortified mine for a resolve boost. Blazi also hit level four and started his medium armor journey with balance, which currently gave him plus 11 defense. Very nice. Femk level eight now is going to enjoy the increased DPS for muscularity, and Katarina gets to enjoy the little fatigue reduction from perfect fit. Good upgrades all around, so let's keep going for more fights. As soon as we leave town, we see a big fight unfold before us. Looks like a Mexican standoff, but it's actually two nomad groups versus one brigand group. That's too much effort, so we wait till it's over and chase the single leader down and pile him in a 7v1. Two rounds of prep, two rounds of destruction, and he never stood a chance or even had a chance to swing his weapon. This deadly team stripped him down to his core, only missing out on his helmet as loot. Nomad plate mail for Chloe and my favorite shield, the sight bar for Katarina. We scout the sands for the other party nomads, but lost their tracks and get ambushed by some ballsy thugs. Other than my overconfidence of putting Enrique in melee, we clean up the foolhardy thieves in five rounds. We camp till the next day to recuperate, sticking around to hopefully catch sight of the nomads again. But no! An angry horde of green boys with berserks and warriors decide to prey on our team of definitely not green skin prepared bros. However, being my cheesy self, a noble army was traveling along the road at the perfect time, so we dragged them into an orc fight. Not the best terrain fighting uphill there, so we grouped in the south and had our eyes on the biggest prize on the battlefield, a mansplitter, the highest damage weapon in the game, except for famed mansplitters, of course. This weapon could easily carry our party in the right hands or cut our bros in too. Caution was our ally, but time was not, as the nobles began to quickly engage and cut down orc after orc. The fencer probably had the same idea as he rushed the mansplitter orc and was working him down. We tried to work our way closer but not to places where we could get surrounded 
surrounded and cut down. A few orc kills to our name were nice, but there were only a few left as the fencer cut the berserker to just 42 HP. Katarina's turn and she slices the orc down to literally 1 HP. You can't make this up. And as you may have expected with my horrible and cursed RNG, a round swing 24% connects and shreds Katarina's body armor and splits her hand in two. The fencer generously waits on his turn, only to have Katarina miss her next two 41%. Just laughable. The fencer claims the kill and the fight was over. A complete missed opportunity that 99% of the time would be in our favor, but not for poor Snow. We get a couple of sellable weapons and a strange mushroom, one of the best damage boosts money can buy, at the cost of the bro's defenses of course. And I accidentally had Enrique eat it. Totally forgot you can't store it in someone's backpack like other items. So at least Enrique would become a DPS king in the next battle. But this pickup actually was a good thing for us, as it had me check the map to try and buy more mushrooms to prep for the final fight. We healed up by camping on the road until morning and returned to Termwatt later in the day. I was ecstatic to see they had a pole flail in stock and grabbed it immediately and put our coffers rather low as a result. We had to get more money and there were still more weapons we needed for our bros. Traveling to Ivanstadt, we trickled down to only 42 coins, quite the risk indeed. We camped till the next day to immediately sell our goods and excess equipment to the markets. Definitely enough to pay rent, but we definitely needed more. A quick find a location quest located another undead farmhouse and it got us a little coin as well. A follow the tracks quest where we proceeded to enjoy the bloodshed a bit too much. Enrique, high on mushrooms, making barbaric and orcish noises along the way, was an unstoppable force of rage and destruction. By now you already know thugs stood no chance against us, but when a single bro gets 9 kills and almost a thousand damage unaided, you know something's up. Even without the mushrooms, this was a strong and favorite build of mine. Returning to the big city in the morning, we decided that our dog Battle Brother deserved an armor upgrade after all the efforts and survivability he had given us thus far. See, in those crucial early to mid game fights, you've seen his heroism and kills, and even now he's been helping us chase down brigands at the end of fights, and I want him there by our side in the final fights with a little bit of extra help to his survivability. So from our single direwolf pelt we had accumulated, we fashioned a leather armor coat for our pup, and we were keen on his improved status. We camped the rest of the day and made the day's long journey to Rorwalt, one of the few sources of weapons near enough to our operations. Day 83 and we grabbed some more mushrooms for Enrique, and were depressed to see the exact weapon Katarino needed was too expensive for our current coffers, and tried to rush to get money before the weaponsmith refreshed his stock. Schwartbuck was the closest village, but annoying spiders stood in our way. I turned back. On our way to Ur's group, raiders ambushed us along the road. I was keen to farm some new equipment and weapons and got straight to work. Two pieces of high ground and we were having a pretty good start to the fight. Femp got pushed back by a shield, but that just let the brigands into range of Enrique's pole flail. Katarina and Frith were just enjoying the south flank, as more and more skulls were shattered at the hands of Enrique. Both flanks cleaned up around about the same time, and the final results showed that even without mushrooms, the pole flail was doing great, six kills and topping damage at 746. Could we be stopped? Was my confidence risking too much, or would those undead find a way to overpower us in the end? I wasn't thinking about any of that, I just wanted new weapons and was getting rather desperate. I quit camp till morning and another raider group tried to engage us. As badly as I wanted the XP and loot, I knew time was running out, and rushed north to hunt for quest money. Ur's group did offer a low statted peddler, but I felt sorry for her, and felt that with a little help she could actually be a pretty decent slinger. Welcoming Beta Logan, Beta for short, this late in the run, was risky but I was hopeful. Rydberg was the final stop on my weapon hunting journey, a glorious witch hunter was amongst the recruits, but since his only ranged mastery was crossbows, sadly I had to say no. We sold what we could here, and while heading back south along the road, a boy cried out to us saying there was an undead zombie attacking his family. We checked, and it was nothing. He came back again and said there was another sighting of an undead. We checked, and it was nothing. This darn kid was just causing trouble. A third time, and I was surprised to see the kid actually had an undead attacking his family. We saved them and told the kid to stop crying wolf. Anyways, we continued our hasty trip south, and 11 thralls decided they found an easy fight. This was definitely not the case, as we decimated them in four rounds. Femp took a few unlucky hits, but other than that, it was pretty smooth sailing. Enrique topped damage as usual, and even the new bros were helping out. Due to this distraction, we had to spend a few hours to heal up in camp. I got distracted in the morning of day 85 and preyed upon some raiders for some free loot. Letting them kill peasants first, of course, since the side of the map and all that. There were a few threats like the miner, but they didn't last long with our relentless throwing weapons, flail headshots, and accurate slashes. Femp tanked the north, Katarina tanked the south. We took a little more damage than expected, but not to the point where anyone's life was in danger. Frith reached level 6 as a result, learning Underdog. Femk was now level 9 and learned Colossus. Badal got her first level up and learned Student. And Enrique, at level 10, got Resilient. The levels were great, but the helmets and armor upgrades really helped the party's survivability. We sold a few things and camped the rest of the day at Ur's group to heal, repair, and salvage. More camping occurred as we found ourselves on day 86 suffering from a lack of tools. It was now that I remember the two-handed flail over at Shansmoor, but it was too late. We arrived and their stocks had already changed. They sold cheap tools at least and we were happy with that. Even better was the profitable patrol quest, my favorite type of noble quest in the game. Freely killing whatever enemies you want for cash is very flexible and the pay was good. We went back north to complete the patrol destinations and after trying to pull brigands out of the swamp for too long, a noble army came by and screwed up my efforts. We joined the fight too late at the edge of the map and were only able to salvage 4 of the 12 potential kills. Unfortunate. We then sold a few items at Ur's group, camped and then got approached by a traveling 
drinking monk, the alcoholic one. And it must have been divine intervention because he was happy to support our cause and said the drinks were on the house. Everyone cheered and merrily had their fill as spirits were high. We touched base with Reedberg before the day ended and I made a risky decision. There was a lovely northern sling for half off on one of the market's shelves and I had to have it. When was the next time we'd ever see something like this on sale or even in store? I mean, our slinger was only level 2, but she'll grow into it. Risky, I know, I know. Anyways, we were ready to continue to the second stop of the patrol and I was horrified to realize this was the worst patrol quest I personally have ever done. The map layout was so bad the quest wanted us to travel a world's length away just for this one quest. Well, we ran as fast as we could and it was a very fortunate sight to have brigands literally running into our arms practically saying, please take our heads. A great time saver and it was only 8 versus 18 with just rabble and thugs. With the forest tiles slowing them down and our strength being way above theirs, we barely took a scratch as we claimed the rest of our quota in heads. Badal reached level 3 and Slinger Spins gave her a nice plus 12 to her range attack, making me feel increasingly better about her new expensive sling. We camped in the clearing till morning to heal, repair, and salvage, but not much respite was in store for us as another brigand group ran from the trees at our group, weapons drawn. 18 enemies again, but this was completely different. Raiders were slightly harder than thugs, but the real scary part was that they had two witch hunters. Rogue witch hunters turned to crime, this seemed to be our rival group in this world. Now witch hunters are unexpectedly scary, because they have rather high accuracy and will easily whittle down your bros with their crossbows that pierce through armor, so I had to find a way to disable them quickly or we could have casualties. Bolt after bolt we were peppered by both of them constantly. We killed as fast as we could, but it took a mad dash by Blazy in round 3 to finally disable the first one. I had almost forgotten about the squire in their ranks and was starting to worry about him too. Definitely stronger than a raider in accuracy and defense. A formidable foe. Kills were still happening despite the decent amount of damage we were taking in return. Femk was in the middle of it all and too many unlucky hits were coming through her strong defense. It was ultimately a 47-37 combo from the pike and cleaver that sent her head flying across the field. 11 days to go and a crucial part of the team was now in pieces on the grass fields. This was rather disheartening, but we couldn't buckle here. I just couldn't lock down that second witch hunter, and it was just fortunate that our bros focusing on melee enemies was efficient enough to make the rest of their range support flee. A victory, but it truly didn't feel like it. Putting Femk in a slightly better position could have helped us, but hindsight is 2020, and with our rival party dead, there was only one final goal ahead of us. We had to keep camping to heal, repair, and salvage. Back-to-back -back fights takes it out of your bros. Just as we were finishing camping, a group of direwolves smelt blood in the water and wanted a piece. I was out. A loss here was enough and we already had enough heads for oh crap return in one day we forgot about the patrol quest we rushed to eisenheim the second stop but before we could get there it was all over all that effort for no monetary reward after losing a bro as well this was definitely a kick in the teeth clo leveled up during this difficult time as we grabbed underdog for more tanking power fem's signature three-headed flail was unused at this point and katarina was given the honor of bringing this weapon back into battle and it was a good decision as we took a specific undead location fight that predictably ended up with skeletons as our foes high level skeletons and an undead hound were a scary fight but luckily there were only five of them in total. The Undead Hound teleports like an alp every time you hit it, so locking it down is no easy task. And nets don't work. The Skeletal Priest throws poisonous gas all over the field and also screams at your bros, stunning them and damaging them on a successful hit. Fortunately, a priest acts like a necromancer and usually keeps some enemies as bodyguards. This staggers the enemy's advance and let us cut down skeletons one by one. However, the Hound was being exceptionally difficult and brought Enrique very low, risking his life. I had to stop chasing the priest to start dealing with this slippery hound before I got another bro accidentally killed. With some effort, we managed to have have no one die this time as we dodge poisonous gas clouds and put the final two skeletons to rest. Not without close taking a scary headshot by the honor guard, of course. Skeletons are truly a different breed of undead and I sincerely hate versing them. We returned to Eisenheim, collected our reward, purchased their gems, and camped a full day to heal, repair, and salvage. Day 92 was where we barely missed out on the opening hours of Ivanstadt's markets, so we had to camp another night away. Before doing so, we enjoyed some more level-ups of our surviving members. Katarina reached the glorious level 11 and finished her medium armor perk tree by taking Lithe and then taking Vengeance for a nice splash of power. Badal reached level 4 and was actually doing a bit of damage with her new sling in these recent fights, so grabbing Gifted felt good to have her stats improve. Training till the next day brought us two more levels. Blazy reached level 6 and picked up Underdog. Theatred was already level 10 and Colossus was a nice choice to buff muscularity and help keep him healthy. We took a follow of the tracks quest to fill the coffers. The game actually pitted us against raiders and a single leader in the easiest combat fight available. We were really seeing the difficulty ramp up now, but I hear some of you fretting and wondering how we tackle leaders being thrown at us constantly. The fight was over in 6 rounds. We took literally zero damage as a result. The enemy broke quickly and I was making sure no one else died before the final fights. Because of our flail tactics, we actually stole the leader's armor and added it to our bro's equipment. Nice. Once again, a sly necromancer offered us extra coin to forego our morales. We weren't born yesterday and stayed loyal to the big city and collected our just reward. Another quick camp to heal, repair, and salvage and we happened across a lone cow in the field. The bros had the stupid idea of seeing who could push it over. I wasn't going to stand in their way of fun and said go for it. Frith drew the short straw and rushed the cow. Probably not the best choice as the cow was spooked and kicked him in the face, breaking his nose. A hilarious sight for sure, and now he knows not to mess with cows. We quickly clean him up, sell some gear, and notice a peculiar quest. 
Hunt the Barbarian King. Not this time, old friend. We'll have to save you for another day. We head west to Termwatt to check their weapon supply. We arrive to find them with almost no weapons in sights. Sucks to be raided. Time is truly ticking. Five days to go and I don't have the team ready at their best. I make the risky decision to travel north to the other Mott and Bailey, Rorwalt. They had the two-handed flail a while ago. Maybe they'll have another? We get there on day 96 and no dice. I'm really worried now. Do I risk the long trek up to Reedburg, the final weapon supplier up north? I'm going to have to at this point. The party needs their weapons. On the way, we spot a bunch of raiders and a leader waiting in ambush. They actually were spooked by us and started to run. I said, screw it, maybe they have loot. I'll take any upgrade at this point and it doesn't hurt to fight them on our way north. The leader immediately reveals himself and it's not the weapon we want. A great axe is a very strong weapon, but not the flail we hoped for. Regardless, we were here now, so we had to win. 7v9 and we quickly cut it down to 8. I was too busy worrying about the damage that the great axe would do to our bros that I was casually wailing on raiders in the front of our group. Except they weren't raiders. These two were actually squires. Crap. Nimble with good stats, they were not going down fast at all. Raiders would have crumpled by now. My formation was sloppy. The raiders up north threatened us with throwing weapons, so I had to have a bro stay there in case of a committed flank. The other flank was breachable, but luckily the woodcutter was cut down before he could attack. The blacksmith received the same fate. A raider walked through and was also flattened, but my face dropped when I realized the big great axe leader could just jump in and do the same. He would not go down so easily and could do some permanent damage. I had to abandon the north flank and placed Klo in the gap, sealing our front line. This led the manhunter to believe we had a flankable back line, as he charged the high ground only to whiff a weakened 5% attack on Klo, as Enrique put him down with the final headshot. The fallen king pinned led to fallen comrades. The fight was ours, and this fight was 110% worth it, as we now had the great axe to ourselves. A very expensive and very strong weapon, but sadly we had no axe users to make the most of it. However, I was aware of the time and took this as a sign. We'll use what we can, and Katarina would take up the axe, even if she was supposed to be a flail bro. Just in case, we still checked Rydberg, but since they had no two-handed flail, we settled on the axe as Katarina's final weapon. With the spare money we had, I bought Frith a Zweihander and sent him to the front line. Almost everything was ready, with not a moment to lose. We trekked back south, and in the morning we quickly checked Urzgrove for some recruits. See, we were actually missing one small thing. With all our new weapons, we had no one to fly our colors into battle. Fortunately, Theodric, a rat catcher, was in town, and he was an exceptional recruit, so we had to have him. A level one with only three days left? A crazy idea, I know. But someone had to be there to keep that banner flying. We quickly geared him up and rushed back south to the undead locations we scoped out as part of our endgame goal. Unfortunately, we were ambushed on the roads by another brigand party, this time with a master archer and a bunch of other ranged units. Not good. Katarina began the fight with a bang, the first use of the axe and the raider was almost torn asunder. This weapon was going to go far. Frith runs forward with his vi and one-shots another raider. This is the power I foresaw and hunted for all these days. It's finally come to this. Katarina flanks south, Klo disabled the master archer, and other than Blazy taking scary shots to put him on 6 HP, things were looking well handled. And Reek released Battle Brother into the flight, and just as we were trying to shut down the range support, the range support shut down us. The marksman one-shots our brand new level 1 bannerman with a 47 bolt to the chest. Fortunately, he was only struck down, and we rushed their archer line shortly afterwards. Frith one-shots another raider with his vine. The only major threat, the leader, is left to Enrique and our ranged duo, who unsurprisingly crumpled him with no sweat. The master archer tried to escape, but we chased him down and won the fight. Thudric became a hero that day, a level 1, surviving a crazy fight like that was a true commitment, and his missing finger was a war wound he'd tell stories of to future generations if we got out of this alive. The fights were quickly ramping up, and the damage we were taking was getting dangerous. A quick camp to fix us up, and during that time, our resident slinger peddler, Badal, was pestering the brand new rat catcher Thudric, trying to sell him some rats, and with that endeavor becoming unsuccessful, he changed his pitch to sell him a goldfish. Nice to see the new bro fit in with the group. Immediately afterwards, we saw a muddy man with a shovel spouting fearful nonsense about something scary he saw. We knew the signs. The undead crisis was upon us. Boys, our training had led us to this point, and we were just hoping it was enough. We set off as quickly as we were able. After dodging Nox on day 98, we quickly stopped by Termont to sell excessive gear, reorganize armor, buy tools, even give Badal sling mastery as part of her reaching level 5. I was happy to see she was being a decent slinger just in time for the end. A quick camp and repair led us to the second last day. The last of our inventory was emptied and I had no spare time left. It was now or never. We ran to the first undead location on our list, the homestead known as the Poacher's Retreat. A legendary geist known as a Winselmutter was hanging around some normal and armored zombies. This would surely be a good warm-up to what was in store later. With six enemies, I boldly rushed the undead but made an immediate mistake. Our new bannerman Thudric didn't have much of anything going for him at this point, let alone a survivable health pool. The Winsel must have sensed an easy target as she horrifically stunned and damaged him with her scream. This meant that he was in range for a follow-up scream the next turn and I had literally no way of moving in before that happened. I was devastated and accepted my mistake and his fate. We were body blocked by some zombies, got a kill, but couldn't push through in time to kill her before the next scream. And the piercing cry rang out and, oh wait, she screamed at Klo. That was unexpected. Quickly, get out of there, Thudric. We have been given a blessing by RNG. Let's not waste it. We released Battle Brother so he could join us in the good fight. He absorbed a horrify and was brought down to 29 HP. But no need to worry as the Winsel was snuffed out and the fight was 
hours. A scary warm-up for sure, and I'll have to be more careful in the next one, but that was the location number two for Undead Ambition. Chloe advanced to level seven, and it was a good time to grab Battleforged, the tanky heavy perk, to take his survivability to the next level. A very quick camp, and we're off to the first Necromancer location. Day 100, the final day. But what's this? The Undead Crisis already had roaming undead parties coming out of the woodworks. Not good. A party of eight killed a caravan and had the gall to attack us. I was surprised, since I didn't think this group of enemies was that threatening. I was more or less correct in my initial assumption. Other than the annoying, stunning screams of the priest, and a few involvements of the Necromancer, we easily cleaned up and ritualistically laid their bones to rest for the last time. Also, without taking much damage at all, Thudric the Banner leveled up and I grabbed Colossus so he wouldn't die as easily to horrifies and poison. Now, without further distractions, a couple hours of camping had us prepped and ready for the first Necromancer lair. This was going to be a fight and a half. We went in and it was 8v12. Not a big force immediately, but we noticed the threats. The pestering undead hound had two fallen heroes in tow. Tanky and dangerous undead, especially with a necro possessing them. But wait, no necromancer to be seen. In a necromancer lair? Slippery bastard. He must have known we were coming. No matter, we had a job to do. Oh crap, round two and two winzels popped into view. Double the screams, double the pain. We had to deal with them as soon as possible. Crap, and two guys as well. This was quite the pickle. First blood was given to our new guy, the level two bannerman had slain the undead hound, and we rallied behind him to get these ghosts. Blazy rushed forward but struggled to get hits on the regular geist. Screams were coming in left and right and it was getting painful. A zombie raised beneath the feet of our banner Thudric and he was vaulted forward where he came face to face with two ghosts. Horrified and fleeing, this was not good. But finally, it was round six and the first geist fell to Enrique's pole flail. But immediately afterwards, this Winzel didn't make the same mistake as the last one did and continued her focus on the weakest link. Thudric was screamed to death. Wait, what? He's not dead? Just struck down? No way, this level two is unkillable. Klo was getting bodied by the Horrify, but in round eight, a beautiful round swing by Katarina split the fallen hero and the Geist in one motion. Enrique bonked the first Winslow out of existence, and it was just one more to go. Blazy got out of range of the horrific screams, just barely on 15 HP. We collapsed on the last Ghost, and Enrique collected his third ethereal kill for the win. Thudric miraculously survived, and only lost an eye as a result. This man was a war hero, and was collecting all the good war wounds to show off later. Better yet was the realization this location had a famed shield as a reward. Famed items don't just come from getting lucky at the shops. Locations in the world can have a chance of dropping famed items as loot, and this one was a beauty. Extra durability and minus three fatigue skills on my favorite shield in the game. Almost a perfect cup. How could I say no? Klo was the one who had the honor of wielding the protector of cleansing fire, and Blazy inherited his old cypher shield. Blazy also reached level seven, and we grabbed Fortified Mind to help with the screams. Enrique reached level 11, perfect timing before the final fight, and we eventually chose Faint to help with killing geists. A quick camp before the day was over, and we would have finished the playthrough exactly on day 100, but fudge, you've got to be kidding me. An undead crisis roaming party here at this specific time in this hemisphere, localized to this one spot of the map. There was no way I was chancing this run and adding this to the final fight. We weren't even fully healed yet, and I was not letting those undead get the better of me. So sadly, we had to waste two days running around and camping to lose the party before taking the final fight. I'm still counting this as 100 days because we would have been fine if that party hadn't come along at the worst time possible. Anyways, details aside, we were here for the final fight and I was ready. Ah, crap, forgot to eat the mushroom. Let's hope it won't cost us. We also ran out of ammunition because of how costly throwing weapons are, so I put the newly acquired top tier one-handed fighting axe on Theodard for when he ran out of juice. The final fight, 8 versus 14, and of course there was a hound. Frith and his sword were on hound duty right now, and we also had a Winzel and a normal Geist to deal with. Not as many ethereals as last time, but a fallen hero with a flail was a risky foe to deal with. Once again, a necromancer lair with no necromancer. These slippery bastards were truly prepared for an undead crisis and let their minions deal with us instead. Classic anime moments right there. Klo takes a horrify and we're slowly getting getting swamped by zombies. Katarina is the only one on ghost patrol and she's swinging at air constantly with those unlucky coin flips. Round five and the zombies are littering the ground, but Klo is literally on eight HP. Those Winzels really know how to pick on our bros. It's not until round six where Katarina finally kills the basic geist. I realized time is of the essence. A single horrifier or a big flail hit could lose us a bro and that Winzel has to go. Katarina pushes through and immediately gets stopped by a 5%. This game knows. It knows. Theater now out of ammunition, ax in hand, charges the Winzel. Frith finally slays the hound. Theater tanks a horrified, but amazingly he shrugs off the stun and can still act. Amazing resilience. The zombies are almost in the dearth, but Frith takes a horrify. The Winzel isn't going down, and she's not going down quietly either. The fallen hero is killed for the first time, and this gives Chloe a chance to escape. Theater in melee brings the Winzel down to her last nine lives with a 17% swing of the axe. It's all down to this. The team rushes the Winzel. The fallen hero is back up, but all eyes are on the big horrify on Frith. 
16 HP and in melee with the ghost. This isn't good. The fallen hero is swiftly downed once again, but the Winzel's hands are too much this time and Frith falls, but not permanently as our bros are too angry to die. He's struck down and the fight goes on. Right after that, it's poetic that Katarina is the rightful one to bring the final blow down on the legendary Geist, and the battle was truly won. Frith survives with the main foot, but with all his combat prowess intact. The team truly did well and performed well enough to get us this far and achieve such a victory. We were rewarded with yet another famed shield as a location drop. This time it was a Pavise shield, the coolest looking shield ever, and it was okay stat-wise, normally compared to a kite shield. The final fights with the Necromancer's minions were over, our personal vendettas were satiated, and even our ambition to clear out four undead locations was complete, all in the span of 100 days, ignoring the silly runaround we had to do. The undead trophy was ours, not a great reward stat-wise, but it was more than that to us. It was our symbol of justice in this corrupt world, a statement and testament to our accomplishments over the last 100 days of rooting out and cleansing evil across the land. Anyways, this was a long one. Apologies, but the combats do take a while. I truly hope you enjoyed the playthrough, and remember you can always enjoy the full gameplay and fights by checking out the 11 and a half hour long VOD on my second channel. Thank you for watching all the way to the end and supporting me and the channel. Don't forget, I also have a Discord channel, and I stream live on Twitch a few times a week, so come and hang out sometime. But regardless, thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. See yous.